Good evening. Welcome to Lighthouse for Jesus Tuesday Night Bible Study. Uh, we will continue with chapter 32 of the book of Exodus. This will be part two of Exodus. Uh, because we did part one last week, but I did not finish uh, this discussion of the last two verses that we read, which were five and six. We, um, I'm going to basically go over that, those, read those verses right quickly. That will be, and when, and when Aaron saw it, meaning the cow, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Uh, and we did discuss the fact that uh, they got up early and they ate and they drank. They got drunk. And then they they sat down to do those things, and after they were full and drunken, they rose up to play. The word play there meaning sexual indecency. It turned into an orgy. Aaron said in verse five that they were having a feast to the Lord. This is actually blasphemous, what is happening right here. Uh, that they, well, we're going to talk some more about what they did. But when you visualize, if you think about it in your mind, if you think about it in the, the eye of your mind, you can only think of a scene of incredible evil. These people who had made covenant with God and who had uh, vowed to God, to keep God's commandments, they are blatantly ignoring and violating <clears throat> those vows. <clears throat> Excuse me. Israel is in a drunken frenzy, worshiping an idol and engaging in all kinds of sexual immorality. One question that entered my mind when I was reading this is where did they get the liquor? Uh, they were in the wilderness. They had just gotten here like a month before. They didn't have time to grow anything to make any kind of liquor. So I'm assuming that they got it from the people in Canaan or somewhere, or they brought it with them from Egypt. I don't know. Uh, but they were drunken. And what they're doing is no different than what the Canaanites do in their worship. Uh, Brother Roger, would you read Deuteronomy 9 and 5? Deuteronomy 9 and 5. Actually make it 4 and 5. Okay. Speak not thou in thine heart, after that, the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me into in to possess this land, but for the weakness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee, not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so you see here, God is giving, through Moses, the reason why he is giving the promised land of Canaan to Israel. And he made it very clear, it's not because of you. It's not that you have done anything so good. It's not that you have done anything so right. But it is for my, I'm sorry, it is because of the 
the wickedness of the Canaanite. Uh, they, you know, it's really, you must really be wicked for God to drive you out of your own land, your own countries, to have somebody defeat you. And he also said that he brought them in, will bring them into the promised land because he has to perform the word that he had promised to the patriarchs. But uh, what I, I wanted to really get out of that is that uh, the, their, the Canaanites were so wicked that they were being put out of the land by God. And uh, they're acting like the Canaanites is what they're doing. While they're worshiping in front of that idol, the smoke didn't stop coming out of Mount Sinai. The fire, the thunder, it was all still going on. Mount Sinai is still covered with the cloud of glory. God appearing as a consuming fire. They can see that from where they are at the bottom of the mountain. They could see, but they don't care. You know, you could see the presence of God, even if you're not in the midst of the presence of God, and you still will do what you want to do, even if it's against the commandments of God. People are really arrogant, and as we will see later on, God keeps telling them they're stiff-necked because they're doing this when they can still see and hear the presence of God, but they're still doing what they want to do. While all of this is going on, they have the bones of Joseph with them, the patriarch. They're still eating manna from heaven every day. They're still drinking water from the rock that followed them. The, 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 they could still see God on Mount Sinai, but they thought that it was taking too long for Moses to come. And so while the Israelites are acting as if the presence of God is among them still and they're worshiping him through the calf. God is giving Moses the plans for the tabernacle where he plans to manifest his presence. And they're trying to get his presence at the same time by worshiping an idol. How ironic and tragic is that. But this shows us how we can become so deluded when we break God's laws. We will think that God is in what we're doing, even if it goes against what God has told us not to do. Aaron and the rest of Israel thought that they could give honor to God, to Yahweh, to Jehovah, to the great I am, through the golden calf. They used the name of God in their worship of that calf. Aaron didn't take away the name of the Lord. He simply added the calf. He compromised so that he would not upset the people. He tweaked it. He made God more palatable. He made God easier for them to digest. They could have their idol, but they could still bring their offerings and have a feast to the Lord in the midst of their sin. This is very important. And I think a lot of times people neglect this part we talk about how Aaron made the calf and they worship the calf, but we don't, uh, we rarely mention the fact that he used it as a worship service 
to the one true God. And so many people are like that in churches today. They feel like they can have it both ways. That's what a lot of church people believe, that they can have it both ways. Do what they want and still worship God. They are, they are in spiritual era. So that kind of worship sells though. That, that kind of worship gets a lot of numbers. That kind of worship gets a lot of people uh, because they can be so comfortable in having what their flesh wants and putting God's name in it. Uh, so there's a lot of leaders, ministers, pastors who are religious hucksters who are selling spiritual snake oil. Selling spiritual snake oil and promising that there is a God that looks a lot like Santa Claus because everything that's said about God is how he's going to make everything good for us all the time. But God is a jealous God. He's not going to share his worship with anybody. Compromise is not a part of God's plan. He does not compromise and he does not want his people to compromise. So spiritual compromise happens when you want a safer, more user-friendly God who will work for you. That's that Santa Claus image. Tell him what you want, right? That God that scared him half to death, well, we don't know if we want to be in the midst of that. You can't negotiate with a God like that. You can't manipulate a God like that to get what you want. You can't work out better terms for the covenant that you make with him. You can't work out terms where things are a little more equal between you and him. And you get to make some of the decisions all on your own. Because with that God that they had seen, all you can do is submit to his awesome power. You see him, you realize how little you are. That golden calf couldn't give him a law. It couldn't demand any obedience. It had no wrath when they did wrong. It had no justice. It had no holiness. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. It had no power. But the good thing about it was it could not intrude on their fun. It couldn't judge them for what they were doing. So a golden calf is a much safer, more user-friendly God. And so many church people today are worshiping the golden calf. They just don't call it that. When you're happy or when you're not happy with God as he has revealed himself to you and you try to remake him and what he says, which again is so prevalent in the modern day church to make, to remake God according to what you want and according to your plan. That is compromising the gospel. Less than two months before this, Israel had heard the voice of God himself thunder from heaven, audibly speaking the Ten Commandments to them. That dramatic experience did not change their hearts. It made many of them desire a less demanding God. It seems impossible that after receiving such a lofty, revelation that they could not possibly stoop to the level that they have right now but we can't look too bad on them we can't think of them in a in a way that it's something that we could never possibly do but because christian experience today is often the same we often see the same thing Okay, Brother Roger, we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 9 and 
read 13 through 21. Deuteronomy 9 and 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them, and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had he had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same, also the same time. And I took your sin, the calf which ye made, and burned it with fire, and snapped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount, into the brook that descended out of the mount. Okay, and I'm going to, we're going back to Exodus 32. And I'm going to read uh, verses seven through 10. Now, we, I read, I had uh, Rogers read more of the sequence of events. So that part is already read. It just has more details on Exodus 32, which we will read, read in parts of what we just read uh, in Deuteronomy 13 through 21. So beginning at the seventh verse of Exodus 32. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. There are such valuable truths in chapters 32, 33, and 34 of Exodus. That's why we're gonna take our time and go through this. So the plans for the tabernacle have been given to Moses, along with the two tablets of stone, with the commandments written by the finger of God. But God, knowing what's going on while Moses is absent. He told Moses about it and he told him to go down to the people. God told him the condition that Israel was in and he threatened judgment. He called Israel your people to Moses in the sense that they now belong to Moses, not to him. So it seems as if God is about to disown Israel. God gave Moses a description of what the Israelites were doing. He characterized the sin which the nation had just committed. He, talked, he gave it in past tense, even though they were still engaged in the, this behavior. He says they have corrupted 
or ruined themselves and they have quickly turned aside. They have violated the covenant that they just made with God. Now they are corrupted, he said. They are not, they are no longer the holy nation which God had set them apart to be. You know, in order to be the holy nation, to be a kingdom of priests that God has called his church to be, we can't break his commandments. We cannot corrupt ourselves. He also said, they have quickly turned aside from the way which God had shown that they needed to walk, the way that they needed to live. The way, the way, W-A-Y, one way. They turned away from that way that had been declared by the commandments of God. That is how we know his way through his command, not by what we interpret or what we feel or how we think society has changed, but according to God's commandments that he has given us. He, all, he said, you didn't wait long, they didn't wait long to go their own sinful way. They had corrupted themselves by their disobedience. And they had done so very quickly. Those solemn vows that they made to God. It seems as if they had forgotten them. Everything that they had promised God. They were very easily deceived into worshiping anything they could see with their eyes. They weren't grounded in the covenant that they had made with God. And I... I have to ask the question. When we could only live according to the doctrine of Lighthouse with Jesus while Sister Anne was alive, were you really grounded in the name of Jesus? What happened? What happened to some of us? It makes you think, it makes you ponder, it makes you sad. The greatest tribute you can give to someone who gave you birth spiritually and grounded you, nourished you, is to remember what they taught you and follow in their footsteps. So God said that these people were stiff-necked. He said they're obstinate, they're stubborn. Stiff-necked means all of those things. Obstinate, stubborn, willful, rebellious, perverse. And willful. I always think in terms of people that are willful as people who love to say, I will. Because they will do what they will do. And that is a satanic principle. That is what Satan says. I will. I will. That metaphor of a stiff neck is taken from a horse that stiffens his neck against the pull of the rain and will not be guided by the rider. And rebellion is so bad that the Bible calls it witchcraft. Being stiff necked is about not wanting to be controlled by the word not wanting to be controlled by the spirit, not wanting to be controlled by your leader. That's rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft. So literally the Israelites were stiff-necked. Over and over in the scripture, God 
are prophets called the Israel stiff necked. So again, God described to Moses everything that had happened. He said they made themselves a molten calf. They worshiped it and sacrificed it. God knew exactly what happened. God always knows what happened. Sometimes people get so out of touch with God or the spirit of God, they actually think God doesn't know what they're doing. The people ignored God, but God didn't ignore them. He still knew what they were doing. And he spoke as if he'd seen enough. And so he made a remarkable offer to Moses. God could have consumed all of those people. We have to realize it was anywhere from two and three million people. He could have consumed them and started all over again with Moses, just like he did with Noah. To have Satan attack you is bad, but to fall into the hands of an angry God is worse. In verse 9, God says to Moses, I have seen this people. Now, here what he's saying is, I have seen who they are. You know how we can see somebody? You can see somebody. But then you could. See somebody, that means you know what they're about. You see, that is what God is saying there. He's saying they have just done, what they have just done is a result of what and who they are. What they are here is not a new thing. It's not a new condition. He said, I've seen this people. What Israel now is, Israel has always been. Israel is not just becoming idolatrous. Israel has always been idolatrous. God knows more about, well, he knows everything that's inside of us, even when we don't know it. If God had intended to wipe out Israel, there would have been no reason for him to tell Moses about it and then send him down to the people. God tells of judgment in advance to give an opportunity for people to repent. So when he said, let me alone to Moses, he was suggesting that if Moses didn't leave God alone, the people would not be destroyed. That's really what he's saying. They won't be destroyed if you leave me alone, even though I'm telling you to leave me alone so I can destroy. Them. The inference here is that if Moses didn't intercede for Israel, I'm sorry, if he did intercede for Israel, God would likely turn his wrath from his people. Moses knew that God's threatened action of destroying Israel and his offer of making Moses a new uh, making a new nation through Moses, that would have been inconsistent with the character of God. It would have been inconsistent with the covenant that he made with Israel. The Egyptians would have been very happy if God destroyed his people. That's what they tried to do. The character of God would be demeaned. For God would not have kept his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Messiah couldn't come through Moses because Moses was a Levite. And the Messiah had to come through Judah. So the words which God spoke were really intended to stimulate Moses to intercede for his people. And thus to bring about forgiveness. So we see how sometimes God is working in a way that we don't even understand. We will see him doing one thing, declaring judgment, when really what he's using it for is to set us up for forgiveness. Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
God didn't ask for Moses to give him an opinion. He didn't ask for Moses to participate in what he was saying. He simply told Moses, let me alone. The clear impression was that if Moses did nothing, the plan would go ahead. Okay, Brother Roger, if you would read verses 11 through 13. Uh, Exodus 32? Yes. All right. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and sayest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Okay. So here we see Moses interceding to the Lord. He was very fervent and eloquent here while he pleased with the Lord. He did not do, he didn't stand by and do nothing. He did not fatalistically say, oh, okay, all right, God. He pleaded. That's what the word besought means. He pleaded with the Lord according to what he believed was really in God's heart. Moses' prayer was not long. This is not a long prayer, but it was very strong. Remember, in prayer, it's not the length, but the strength. To avoid spiritual compromise, God's people need strong leaders like Moses who will pray for God's glory through his people. God's command drove Moses to prayer. And when it says, well, we haven't gotten that yet. We read 11 through 13. I'm going to just read verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So, suffice it to say here that God, God's repentance looks at things from our point of view. It seems to us when we read this as if God changed his mind in response to our prayers, when actually, his purpose has been ordained from eternity. He never changes. In ways we cannot understand, he brings us to our knees and uses our prayers to accomplish his will. Strong leaders who get God's compromised people back on track are people who pray as Moses did here. Even though God offered to make a mightier and a greater nation out of Moses, this was really a test for Moses. At least that's how I see it. It was a test to prove the character as the leader of the nation and the mediator of the covenant. If Moses had agreed to God's plan B, which is, okay, Moses, I'm going to start all over with you. It would have revealed Moses' desire for personal glory. But Moses passed the test with flying color. I believe that Pastor Rossell said something on Friday night uh, 
that concerning Pastor Donnie, who had really reacted with something regarding him the same way that Moses reacted regarding God's people. He was not looking for glory, but he was looking for someone being grounded in salvation. It wasn't about personal glory. When Moses prayed, he turned it around from God saying, your people, Moses, that you brought out of Egypt. He turned it around and, and gave them back to God. He prayed that the person and character of God would be revealed through Israel. He said, Lord, they belong to you, not to me. He appealed to God on the basis of grace. He said, we didn't deserve to be brought out of Egypt to begin with. You did it by your grace, not because we deserve it. So he appealed to the grace of God. And then he appealed to the glory of God. He said, this will discredit you in the eyes of the nation. They will say that you brought your people into the desert to kill them. Don't let anybody think that about you, God. We see here where Moses is filled with compassion for the people, but his chief concern right here is for the honor for the name of God. Many times when we minister to people who have backslidden or who are beginning to go uh, back, we will say to him, we will say to that person, what are you doing to the name of God? How are you making God look? Finally, Moses appealed to the goodness of God. He said, Lord, keep your promises. You are God who has always been faithful and you have made some promises to our forefathers. And you'll notice all through the word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are repeated over and over again. And as Christians, when we pray, we need to have repetition in the sense of reminding God of his promises. Lord, your promise. Lord, your promise. Because God always keeps his promise. Because God cannot deny himself. God answered Moses' prayer. He could have destroyed the nation. All Moses had to do was leave him alone and accept plan B and let him do what he said he would do. But Moses didn't leave God alone. He labored in, in intercession according to what he knew was the heart of God. And the Lord was moved with compassion to save his people. Now, I'm going to read Numbers 23 and 19. Numbers 23. Twenty three and nineteen says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? These scriptures seem to contradict each other. Exodus thirty two and fourteen and numbers uh twenty three and nineteen. But that is not a contradiction. We understand that many times God is speaking through his writers by using man-centered language. Moses here is describing the actions of God as they appeared to him. 
Moses' prayer didn't change God, but it did change the standing of the people in God's sight. The people are no longer in a place of judgment. They are now in a place of mercy. And that is what we can do through our prayers. We can actually change the standing of ourselves and others in our intercession. God didn't destroy Israel. And God knew from the very beginning that he wasn't going to destroy Israel. Yet he deliberately put Moses into this crucial place of intercession so that Moses would display and develop God's heart for the people, a heart of love and of compassion. Moses prayed just as God wanted him to, as if heaven and earth, salvation or destruction depended on his prayer. That is how God waits for us to pray. Moses had to develop a heart of a shepherd. I remember in the growing and the maturing of our church through the years, how we would stop church service and just go into intercession for hours. People have been saved through that kind of intercession. Their names being called through the spirit of God and the whole church interceding. Lives have been spared. Lives have been changed. The course of the natural elements have been changed through that kind of prayer. We should pray as if our lives and other people's lives and souls depend upon our prayers. That is how Moses prayed at this time. No, Moses was never more like God than he was then, praying for those people, sharing God's mind and his loving Living under the new covenant, we don't have less privilege in prayer than Moses had. We don't have less access to God than Moses had. The only thing we have less of is the heart of Moses for the people. Okay, Brother Rogers, uh, verses 15 through 18. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, and said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing, do I hear. Okay. So after pleading for the lives of the children of Israel, Moses quickly went down the mountain to stop them from doing those things that they were doing that were so displeasing to God. So in the midst of this great idolatry, Moses and Joshua came down from the extended state on Mount Sinai. Moses brought the two tablets of the testimony written by the hand of God on both sides. It's significant that it stated that the tablets were written by God's direct hand. That is to show us that all commandments and morality standards must come from God's standard and character. It should not be up to the opinions or the changing values of men. We see here, we remember that Joshua had been with Moses when he went up in chapter 24. Uh, so as Moses went all the way up, it seems that Joshua waited for him 
somewhere up the mountain. He could not go all the way. Uh, and he stayed there those 40 days and 40 nights. So he also was not aware of what had happened in the camp. He heard the noise of the people as they shouted. So there was so much noise, they were having so much fun. The people of God. You know, when I read this and uh, it brought something to my mind, I remember. Well, I was never a person who went to festivals and to the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, when they have all the music at night and all of that I, from different bands, I was never a person to do that. Um, I would be, I, when I was younger, I would be in a parade, then I would go to my house. But we did, fundraisers at some point by putting setting up a booth during festivals and i remember one night i felt as if i was in a a um a jungle or I don't even know how to describe it. But at one end of the street, there was this rhythm and blues band. And at the other end of the street, there was this country and Zodico band. And in the middle, the whole block, there were all of these people. There was all this loud music just from each end of the block. And I, the beat and you could feel it darum, 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 and all the bodies glistening with sweat and moving to that I thought I was I, I, I was so frightened I was like this is not real this is crazy and I never went back after that because and I'm imagining that that's kind of how they were acting it's actually frightening to be in the midst of that kind of physical excitement. And we have to realize also, these people were having an orgy. They were having sexual, openly uh, having sexual uh, immorality with each other. There was nakedness. They were shouting and screaming and making all this noise that they heard it up the mountain. Joshua thought that, that an enemy had attacked the camp. He thought it was the noise of war. In a way, he was right. It just wasn't a physical war. It was a spiritual war. But Moses knew better. He said, it's not the sound of shouting of a cry of strength or of winning a battle, of having the victory. It's not the cry of someone who has been overcome and is, is, is wailing and, and howling because they have been overcome. But these, this is the kind of noise that comes from people who are having fun. He says they're singing. They're singing, they're being entertained, they're having a great old time. And Moses could better understand because he already knew what the children of Israel were doing because God had told. So he could better judge the nature of that sound. And Moses, would not realize just how bad it was until he saw it for himself. And next week, we're gonna find out what happened once Moses got down that mountain and once he confronted Aaron. 
that will be part three. This is part two of Exodus 32. Next week will be part three. And if I had a title for it, I think I told you guys that already. It's not my fault. After that, we're going to get to who is on the Lord's side. That will be the end of chapter 32 of Exodus. I praise God for all of you who joined with us tonight. Uh, are there any questions? No questions again. Okay. Pastor Donnie, are you there? No? Okay. So, I praise God for all of you who joined us tonight. Now, I would like to say this, guys, all my sisters and brothers, be very careful right now. Things are getting worse again. Do I hear okay. someone? What? Hey, Brian. Hey, Pastor Donnie. Praise the Lord. Happy anniversary to you and Sister Cindy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, thank you. It's Pastor Donnie.